Okay, so welcome to our next lecture, which is lecture seven. And now we're going to start doing some a little bit more advanced calculus. And we're going to kick off with something called the newton rapson method. So the newton rapson method is an iterative method. Um, it's used by, we use the computations, to help us solve complex problems that we can't easily solve quickly uh, by just doing using sim, uh, simple rules. So what is it actually, what, what do we use it for? And what were we using it for in this module? Well, actually we're using it to solve roots. So we've done the, earlier we've done the factorization to help us solve roots. Now we're actually gonna apply a method which helps us solve really complex roots that we might not be able to solve. So say for example, you might have a function of x to the five multiplied by x to the 27 plus three x uh, divided by the square root of x. We can't solve this easily, but we can use an iterative method to help us get there. So how does it work? So I'm going to just explain where it comes from and how it works, and then we'll begin to, we'll do a, a problem with it. So we'll take our usual axes of, we have y and x here. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a function and we're going to call this y equals f of x, something like that. So we're trying to find this point, and we're going to call this A, our point in which we cross the axis. Um, and how are we going to do this? Well, what we can do is we can, we've been describing the last few weeks about how this curve changes. So we've been looking at dy by dx and how we can use a differential function to be able to help us describe the constant changing of the curve. So say, for example, we choose a point P. Well, what we know from differentiation is, well, actually, from this point P, we can easily work out what the instantaneous gradient is, which would give us a line here. We also know from this function that what the height would be uh, here. So if we call this point maybe our original, uh, we'll call this B, and we'll call this point Q. What we can also say is, well, we're going to have some distances. So to get this original b, we would have to choose a value, maybe we'll call it x0. And what q is, is going to actually going to be, it's going to be our next value as we move along, because we know from this equation, where we, if we're trying to solve this second point where we cross the, the x, well, if we're trying to solve this triangle, we can work this out with some simple geometry, which perhaps we call this x1. We then also have a distance between these two, which we'll call h. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So we have now this triangle. So if we draw this triangle, and um, we're going to do some geometry on it. We're going to do some, uh, so, so this is p, this is b, and this is q. Okay, so uh, we know our two distances, but if we wanted to work out this change, or our change in y of our change in x, to help us find this q, well, what we could say is, well, uh, from our y equals mx plus c, we know that's the change in y over the change in x. So our change in y over change in x would be equal uh, to uh, pb over qb. But we have to remember this is our point about our set point, which we chose here. So we'll use these Macaron brackets just to point this out. So what we can do from this relationship is we can define where this x1 is because we know the differences uh, from, from our previous uh, triangle geometry. So now we have this relationship, we can begin to actually expand this out and tidy up a little bit. So we know our height here, which would be p to q, because this is just y equals f of x. So we could say that pb equals uh, f of x. I've already told you that we know that well, PB over QB is our instantaneous uh, differential. So perhaps we could now say that this would be equal to our differential of our function. Because if we remember back to the last few weeks, we've described our functions as we've described our differentials of a function that which we can describe the curve. So this makes perfect sense here. So this now means that we can tidy this up a little bit so we could use our simultaneous equations again. We know PB here. This could go into there. So we could say that QB is equal to PB divided by our function of 
at f dash of x, which then leads to us saying that this equals to f of x zero divided by f of dash x zero. Right, okay, so what we have here is our QB, but what we earlier defined is, well, we defined that this would be a distance of h, so we could say that is equal to h. So h equals to f of x zero divided by f of dash x zero. But we also know that we have our x zero value and our x one value, which we previously defined. And to calculate these is, well, we know that if we want to find out what h is, it must be x zero minus eight minus x one. So we could say that x, so we could say that h equals x zero minus x one which would then lead us to the function that we have that x1 equals x0 minus f of x0, all divided by f dash of x0. So we now have some sort of an equation. And this equation will help us get closer to this value x1, which is actually closer to our value a, or our q value, so which is closer to our a. So what does this mean? Well, this is actually an iterative process now. So if we draw our axis back here, this is our y and this is our x and this is our function, and we know that this is a. Well, if we know that our original value p is here, and we're going to call that p, and we can call this uh, we call this uh, b here, and we've now just worked out where this point crosses here, which is our x1. Well, what we can do is now we know this value for x1, we could stick this back into here, actually calling x0, x1, making these two functions about x1, which will give us a value of x2 here, which what would happen is by solving this x2, we'd get closer to our original root. So if we did this over and over and over and over again, well, what actually happens is we begin to solve the problem and we begin to get a very accurate answer for a. So this would limit to infinity and what we talked about maybe in the first few lectures or first lecture. And this is the way which we can solve to an nth decimal place. Of course, we would never get the exact value, but we'd limit so close that the difference would be so small. So I'll give you a quick example now. and This could be an exam style question. Say we have the equation uh, f of x equals x cubed uh, minus 3x minus 4 and we're going to say we want to solve this for zero uh, to find the root. Well, we know actually this is a cubic, so I'll probably spot this first in the exam. And you're going to have a couple of problems to solve. It's going to cross a few times over the line. So what we might say is it's going to be between two functions. And in this question, it says that it's going to be the answer is going to be between f equals one and f equals three. So we know that we're fighting in between these two where it crosses the line. Well, the first thing we can say, we have our function equals x cubed minus 3x minus 4. Our differential, therefore, would be uh, 3x squared minus 3. OK, so we now have our two descriptors. Well, I've just shown you that the equation where we have here, we have uh, x1 equals x0 minus our function of x all over our uh, x uh, dash, um, a function of x dash or differential. So what we can do is we can begin to put these values in. So we could say our x1 value would be equal to our x0 value minus our f of x, uh, f of x, uh, zero, sorry, I should put these in, minus uh, x cubed minus 3x minus 4 all over our 3x squared minus 3, and now we can begin to plug some values in. So what we've been told is that our f1 and our f3 values are two limit boundaries. They've got to be 1 and 3. So we might take a guess and choose a value between these that we can call x0. So quite reasonably is you can say, well, between 3 and 1, uh, the value we're going to choose is 2. OK, so we can begin to stick all these values in. So we can now say our x1 value equals 2 minus 2 cubed minus uh, 3 times 2 minus 4 all over 3 times by 2 squared minus 3. And what this means is we can then stick that into the calculator and we'll find our value for x1 is going to be close to 2. 
and we're actually going to get something that looks like x2.222. Okay, so now maybe we want to do this again because this is a, a value which we are, we're not sure it's right, but we want to see if it converges. So we can say now we're going to take the same equation um, where we have that we're going to say that x2 uh, equals x1 minus our functions here again. So that's the same x cubed minus 3x minus 4 all over 3x squared minus 3. So we can stick our number in here. We can say that x2 equals 2.222 uh, minus uh, 2.222 cubed minus 3 times 2.222 uh, minus 4 all over 3 times 2.222 squared minus 3. And what this is going to give us, we have our x2 value, which now equals 2.196. We can continue this uh, for one more value. So we'll stick it in to find our x3, which equals 2.196 now, uh, minus uh, 2.196 cubed minus 3 times 2.196 minus 4, all over 3 times by 2.196 squared minus 3. And if we stick this into our calculator, x3 is equal to 2.196. So this means we've now converged. And again, this is something I was talking about the previous week with doing the trapezium rule. Depending on the precision, how accurate you want the answer, this could be uh, just what we need uh, to solve our problem. You could keep on going to infinity, infinity, and this would give us a really accurate answer to solve the final problem. So what we've done here is we've now shown that for this curve, that if we were to draw it, and we have y and we have x, we have our lower and our upper boundaries, and we said it was between 1 and 3. Our cubic uh, point would look a little bit uh, like this. So we, what we can say is the point in which this crosses the x-axis here is at 2.196. So we've got a really accurate way of describing, or an accurate way of solving this problem, and it also means that we don't have to do this analytically or go all the way through and solve by expanding out the brackets, it gives us a solution straight away. So that's been the Newton Rapsub method. It's a really handy method, especially if you're going to be doing some sort of models in your dissertations. So do remember it and you might come back to it.